Have you ever felt overwhelmed by the math that's involved in a case interview? If you have, don't worry. By the end of this video, you're gonna be very comfortable with case math because I'm gonna show you everything you need to know in order to pass the case math portion and be on your way to lending your consulting offer. But before we dive into the technicals, let's actually talk about, first off, what exactly is case interview math? Case interview math, also known as case math, is just a way for you to represent business problems using math. We're gonna talk about why this is important in a bit, but the thing that you need to know here is that when interviewers are giving you case math, they're trying to figure out how comfortable are you with handling numbers? But the good news is you don't need a finance degree, an MBA, or a PhD in math in order to understand case math. In fact, almost all the math that you actually need, you've already learned by the time you took algebra one. And to make you even less worried, know that there's only a few math formulas you actually need to know in order to succeed in case math. And today, I'm going to go over the most common six with you. But before we dive into what those six are, I actually want to talk about why is case math used at all? Why not just give you a pass and do no math during the case interview? The reason why case math is so important is that you actually use it to your day-to-day -day as a management consultant. That's because during your day-to-day, -day, you're going to have a lot going on and you're going to be running from place to place, task to task, deadline to deadline. And it's important as a consultant that you're able to juggle and prioritize what to do. So for example, let's say that you're on a cost-cutting case and there's three different departments that you can meet with, but you only have time today to meet with one. Well, you could probably do some mental math in the back of your head and think about, well, which department has the most cost and where do we think we can have the most savings? I'll probably prioritize that department. So you can see how mental math on the run helps you eliminate wasteful work and also simplifies the work that you need to do. But doing mental math isn't just about prioritization and efficiency. It's also about being able to build confidence with the clients. As a consultant, you're going to be working with clients. If you can only do math by pulling out your phone or pulling out an Excel sheet, then the client in the middle of a meeting might not feel so confident about hiring you for a future project. So you want to be able to show that you're competent even if you don't have a phone or an Excel sheet near you. Third reason why mental math and case math is so important is that it allows you to be able to sense check your answers. So while in consulting, you will have a calculator and you'll build a lot of models out, let's say in Excel, you need a way to be able to fact check that the numbers look right as well as the formulas are correct. And if you don't have a fundamental understanding of where the formulas come from, then your model might mess up. And if you recommend a client to make an investment and it's based on a wrong assumption, then you just cost the client millions, if not billions of dollars. So you need to be able to have some fundamental mental math. And in order for interviewers to know that you can do the math, they have to be able to test you at some point during the interview process. And it's hard to be able to test that on your resume, so they have to do it in the actual case interview itself. So that's why interviewers use the case math to see if you're actually comfortable with doing case math live. Because if you can do it during a high intense situation like the case interview, you'll be able to do it when you have plenty of time as a consultant. In other words, developing your mental math not only will help you pass the case interviews, it's actually gonna help you become a great consultant as well. The good news is that you don't need to memorize hundreds of math formulas to pass your case interviews. In fact, there are six common ones that you'll encounter time and time again. So in this video, I want to focus on why it's important and how you can get comfortable with each one. To illustrate these formulas and get you comfortable with these formulas, we're actually going to use a hypothetical case interview prompt. So the prompt that we're going to use today is for a client called Sweetco. So they're a candy company and for the last five years, they've seen declining profitability. So let's see how we can help Sweetco and also master case interview math formulas at the same time. If you master each of these six, the case interview will become a lot easier. But I don't want this help to stop right here. I want to make sure that you walk into your interviews feeling confident. So I want to help you in two more ways. First off is if there's a math formula or math question, or you're struggling with a certain aspect of case math. So for example, if you're struggling with break even and you type in break even below, I'll send you some additional resources to help you master that skill. And by the way, if you're interested in becoming a management consultant, I have a surprise for you. I want to give you free access to a limited time workshop that my team and I are hosting. During this workshop, we reveal exactly what consulting firms like McKinsey, Bain, and BCG are looking for when they're thinking about who to interview and who to give offers to. And for a limited time, I want to give you access for free. To find out more details about how you can get free access, check out the link below. One of the most common case interview questions revolves around a company's profitability. The goal of the case is then to help the company increase its profitability. Profit is the amount of money left over after a company has paid all its expenses and collected all of its revenue. It's typically calculated over a set period of time, such as a month or a year. And the formula you need to know is profit equals revenue minus cost. As you can see from this formula, there are two main ways for companies to increase their profits. You can either bring in more revenues faster than it increases cost, or it can cut costs faster than it decreases its revenue. As we know from the case, prompt, Sweetco has experienced five years of declining profits. To figure out why and how we solve this, we need to take a closer look at both their revenue and their costs to see which one is driving the problem. First, let's look at the revenues. Revenues, also known as sales, is the total amount of money that a company receives from selling its products or services. It's always measured in form of a currency such as US dollars or European euros. 
To calculate revenue, you need to know the volume of product that's sold and at what price it's sold at. So depending on which data you have, the formula you'll use is going to be revenue equals volume times price. The other side of the profit equation is cost. And there are two types of costs, fixed costs and variable costs. Fixed costs are expenses that do not change regardless of how much product or service is produced. For example, Sweetco likely has fixed costs including rent and management salaries. These costs do not change if Sweetco increases its candy production or not, unless it builds a entirely new factory. The other type of cost is variable costs. These costs do go up the more production or sales you have. For Sweetco, for example, this can include the cost of sugar, flavoring, and the people who created the production labor. Since there are two types of costs, to calculate the total cost, all you have to do is add up the two costs together which is total cost equals fixed cost plus variable cost. With these two formulas, now that we know the revenue as well as the cost, you can figure out for Suico, for example, what their current profitability is. And if you have information for the last five years, you can actually just look at what the profits are for each of the years and to figure out what's happening that's causing profitability to go down. For example, is revenue going down while costs are the same or even increasing? Or is revenue increasing, but cost is increasing faster than revenue? But let's imagine, for example, in Suico's case, that we find out the cost is increasing. So how do we know which one is causing the problem? Is it fixed cost or is it variable cost? In order to do that, you need the second formula, which is the profit margin. Profit margin is a metric that's used to measure how much profit the company makes as a percentage of its revenues. Formula is profit margin equals profit divided by revenue. The higher the profit margin, the healthier the business. For example, let's say that the interviewer tells you that the profit margins have decreased from 25% to 15% over the last five years. This indicates that the company is not operating as efficiently as it could or that competition in their market is getting more intense. The profit margin is a useful tool to identify which areas within the business could potentially improve its profitability by improving its efficiency. In order to determine what area of the business needs to be improved, you need to understand three types of profit margins. The first is net profit margin. This measures the company's overall profitability after all of its expenses, including all the taxes and interest it pays on a loan, for example. This is the most common type of profit margin case interview formula that you will use. The second type are called gross profit margin. This gives you an idea of the profitability of the company's core operations. It only considers the revenue and the cost of goods sold, which are the expenses that incurred when you produce a company's product or services. The third type of profit margin is known as operating profit margin. This takes it one step further from the gross profit margin. It also takes into account other operating expenses such as rent, utilities, but it excludes taxes and interest expenses. During your case interview, you can ask the interviewer for each of these types of profit margins because they provide a different perspective on a company's financial performance. For example, if Sweetco's gross profit margin is decreasing more than its operating profit margin, it indicates that the cost of the candy ingredients might be the reason why the profits are going down. So it becomes a variable cost issue rather than a fixed cost. You can see here that viewing the margins from these three different views allows you to see what the problem could be. The first First two formulas that we talked about, profit and profit margins, as you can see, go hand in hand together. So let's go back and look at the other four that you need to know. The third most common formula that you need to know is the break-even formula. Break-even, also known as the payback period, is a financial metric that helps companies determine how long it would take to recover their initial investment in a new project or purchase. It's usually measured in years and is calculated by break-even equals initial investment divided by annual profit. For example, let's say that we do the analysis for Suico and we realize that maybe they should increase their revenues by trying to expand into a new market. And let's say that we think that they can expand to a new market, in this case, let's say the chocolate market, but it would require us to build a factory that would cost about $2 million to produce the chocolate. And let's say that we project out that the factory can produce an additional $250,000 in annual profit. Using the break even formula, which is taking the investment cost, 2 million, and dividing by the annual profits, 250,000, we calculate that it would take Suico eight years to recoup its initial investment. One thing to note is that it's also important to note that the break even analysis is just one of the many factors you would consider before entering entering a new market or to make an initial investment. For example, you might look at market competition or future growth. For the simplicity of this example, I just wanted to focus on the break-even formula. If you do encounter the break-even formula, one thing you can do to impress your interviewer is also to think about the return on investment. The return on investment, also known as ROI, is a metric that helps companies measure their investment effectiveness in generating additional profits. Return on investment helps companies determine whether or not an investment is worth the resources or to choose an alternative investment. A higher ROI means that there's a better return on investment while a lower ROI means less profits generated relative to the investment cost. Let's say, for example, Sweetco is considering investing $500,000 in a new packaging machine for their gummy candies. The machine will help reduce costs and increase efficiencies. And let's say that the annual savings for this investment is $75,000. We then use the ROI formula to figure out what kind of investment return this is. The ROI formula is this. Return on investment, or ROI, equals profit from the investment 
divided by cost of investment times 100%. So thus, you can do $75,000 divided by $500,000 times 100, which gets you 15%. This means that for every dollar that SweetCode invests in its new packaging machine, they can expect to earn an additional 15 cents in profit. This ROI calculation can help SweetCode determine whether or not this new machine is worth pursuing or if they should invest in something else. The fifth formula you need to be able to master is known as the market share. Market share is the percentage of the total sales in a particular market that a company makes. This metric can vary from 0%, which means the company has no presence in the market, to 100%, which means that the company has complete dominance in the market. Calculating market share can also also provide insight into potential challenges and opportunities for a company within a market. For example, if a company already has a high market share, it suggests that there's limited room to grow. Factors that impact the market share include brand recognition, distribution, and pricing strategy. To calculate the company's market share, you need to take the company's revenue in the market and divide it by the total revenue within the market. For example, going back to our Sweetco example, let's say that the chocolate market that we're going after is worth $150 million, and we believe that Sweetco in its first year can capture $15 million. That means that we project that our market share in the first year would be 10%. That is $15 million divided by $150 million. The sixth and final case math formula you need to know is how to calculate the growth rate. Growth rate tells us how much a company's revenue or other metrics has increased increased or decreased over a period of time. We can calculate it by comparing this year's current revenues to the previous. The formula that you would use is growth rate equals the new metric minus the old metric divided by the old metric. For example, let's say that Suico had $100 million in revenue this year and $120 million in revenue last year. To calculate the revenue growth, we would use the formula growth rate equals 100 million minus 120 million divided by 120 million. In this case, it is negative 20%. That is to say, Suico's revenue has decreased by 20% from last year to this year. As you can see, a growth rate can be positive and it can also be negative. A negative growth rate means that there's a shrinkage in the metric. So for example, in our case, there was a shrinkage in revenue, but if there was a shrinkage in cost instead, that could also be a positive sign. So whether or not a negative or positive number is a good thing depends on the metric that you're measuring. All right, so we covered a lot in this video, a lot of math formulas, and you're probably wondering, hey, Davis, that was a lot. Do I actually need to go back to this video every single time, or is there a place I can find all these formulas? Good news for you, I actually have a bonus cheat sheet that I'm gonna share with you so you can find all these math formulas, including some additional ones that you also wanna be familiar with as well. I will include the link where you can download this in the description below. All right, so now that you know the six common math formulas you need to know, let's talk about how you can actually internalize these because for a lot of people, practicing case math can be really daunting. All right, so these are my five tips for making sure you're comfortable with case math. Beyond just knowing the formulas. First, practice the basics. As I mentioned earlier, all the case math that you need to learn, you've already learned by the time you finish Algebra 1. So you want to refresh your knowledge on basic multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. You also want to be familiar with key fractions, knowing that 1 eighth is the equivalent of 0.125 or 12.5%. And of course, I recommend that you review the six common case math formulas that we covered in this video. Second, you want to make sure that you have consistent practice with case math. Practice mental math consistently throughout your mock interviews and anytime you get a chance. For example, if you're paying a bill or an expense, practice case math in everyday situations. Third, you want to simplify your math and use simple numbers and round as much as you can. For example, let's say that the math requires you to multiply 62 times 78. You can actually just round this to 60 times 80, which is a lot easier to multiply. And then my final two tips are what happens during the actual interview itself. One thing I want you to do is to clarify concepts and expectations with your interviewers. So for example, if the interviewer is using a term that you don't understand, but you might think is related to something else. So for example, if they're using operating expense margin and you're like, hmm, is that the same as operating margin? You might want to clarify that with the interviewer before you solve for the wrong formula. Second, feel free to confirm details and numbers. So for example, if you weren't sure if you heard 16% or 60%, that's pretty important to clarify with the interviewer before you do the wrong math formula. And third, if you're unsure of something, for example, let's say that you want to round numbers, but you're nervous about rounding the numbers, just ask the interviewer if you can round numbers. And the final tip I have here is to remember to relate back your case math to the main problem. Here, you want to focus on drawing insights from the numbers and relating them to the business problems. As consultants, the clients pay us not to just generate numbers, but to tell them what does the numbers actually mean? How does this impact my business? So for example, going back to our Suico example, with every math that we did, we should be asking, how does this help us help Suico improve their profitability? So for example, let's say that we ran the numbers and we decided that there's two opportunities for us to improve profitability. One is to increase revenue by entering the chocolate market and the other is to improve our current operations by reducing cost. All right, and there you have it. If you're serious about becoming a management
management consultant, I'd love to help you. My team and I are former McKinsey, Bain, and BCG recruiters and interviewers who help applicants land interviews, prepare for their assessments, and pass the interviews so that they can land their offers at firms like McKinsey, Bain, BCG, and so many other amazing consulting firms. And for a limited time, you can access this training all for free. In it, we share with you the step-by-step -step proven process that has helped over a thousand people land their consulting offers at some of the biggest firms in the world. And all you have to do to access this training is to check out the link below. And the proven method that you're going to learn in this workshop, we've used to help 90% of the people we work with land at least one consulting offer. In fact, many land multiple offers. And we're going to give it to you away for free. All you have to do to gain access to this is to check out the link below. Joining this workshop could put you one step closer to landing your dream consulting offer.